So how we doing tonight? That's right. I need everybody on your feet. Do you guys know this song? We're gonna sing this together in faith. Would you declare that Jesus is worth following anywhere? Let's sing this. You make it easy to love you. Yes. Sing that. You make it easy to trust you. Do you believe that tonight, students? You have never left my side. You've been faithful every time. And no.
to TR students. Yeah, yeah, we are yeah. so excited that you guys are here tonight. How are y'all feeling tonight? <laughs> Kiss me every week, man. I love it. Uh, well, tonight is a very special night at TR students. Now, I know that every night is special at TR students because it's awesome. We love having you guys here. But tonight, we are celebrating our seniors in the room, our high school seniors who are graduating. Yeah. Yeah, let's give them a hand. In fact... Where are my seniors? Let me hear you. Let Where me you see at? your hands. Where you at? Nice. That's awesome. Well, it's so awesome to have you guys here, and we can't wait to celebrate our seniors. We had some Lacoretta for them. We got some stuff we'll tell them about after the service as well. Yeah, absolutely. Tanner, so correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. But wrong. <laughs> someone wrong. already corrected me. <laughs> wrong. But if they're seniors now, yeah. that means that they most likely – were born in 2003. Okay. Right? Which, who's, who's born in 2003? All right, so, so I, I think I was, I think that's I about did 30 the math, years right, ago. Right? Yeah. 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 
which means they're they're really really old. They're yep. about ready to go to like the Golden Corral, get the senior discount, <laughs> you know, have a blast there. You. But <laughs> hopefully they haven't already started losing their memories because Ooh. we want to see if you guys remember what it was like in 2003. So we got a little quick game for you. Look to the screens. Yes. So this says the year was 2003's play. Uh, two, oh my goodness. The year was 2003. So which one of these took place in 2003? Was it Ugg Boots became famous, the first season of the TV show Survivor, iTunes launch, or the biggest blackout in US history in the Northeast? What do you guys think? One, two, three, or four? Yell it out. I hear four and three. Oh, two? Two? OK. And I hear one, so they want it all. <laughs> Let's see what the answer is. Three. Ooh. Man. Apple. iTunes. Oh, uh, here we go. We got it right here, too. iTunes came out in 2003. Does anybody still use iTunes, or is it all Spotify and? Apple Music. Apple I Music. Love, yeah, wow. See how old I'm getting? <laughs> Josh, let's, let's check out the second one. You want to check out the second one? What Pixar movie was released in 2003? <laughs> one, Monsters, Inc. Two, Cars. Three, Toy Story 2. Or four, Finding Nemo. I see a five. five. I see some threes, twos. I say we find out. Yeah, let's find out. Let's what, find out. Which one is it? Finding oh. Nemo. Just keep swimming. Is that is oh that just keep swimming? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Dory. Classic. Just keep swimming. Nice. That's that's insane. Okay, let's check out our next one. Let's see what else is in 2003. The average cost of gas. Okay, this one's gonna hurt for anyone who buys their own gas. Was it 98 cents? A dollar 59. 203 or 235. What do you guys think? I see some twos. There's some twos. So. Wow. There's some I ones. There's a one. Nice. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see what it is. It was Two. a. Oh. It was a dollar fifty nine oh. for gas. That's good wild. old days. <laughs> Definitely not not that uh, cheap now. Yes. Now it's like ten dollars. <laughs> All right, let's yeah, check out no, the last one. Last one. What was the average cost of a movie ticket in 2003? One, four, 13. Two, five dollars and 54 cents. Three, six dollars and nine cents. Or four, seven dollars and 32 cents. I mean, now it's like 12 or 13 for a ticket. What yeah. do you guys think? Number one, number um, one. They say either three, four? La twos. Latus. Two. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, one, two. Let's find out. <laughs> two. Someone over here knew that, and I don't know how they knew. You, That's you pretty knew impressive. It. He's, <laughs> He's not, not even, even a senior. senior. <laughs> he knew it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Man, Tanner, 2000. That's like making me feel nostalgic, and it seems like yes. 2003 was such a long time ago. Oh my word. Which means, you know, if seniors are old, I don't know what that means for us. Because we're just a, we're just a little bit older just a than little, they are. Just a little bit older. So we're just ancient. We're about to like get the walkers out in wheelchairs. We're the, we're gonna get the rolling. senior citizen discount here soon because we're so <laughs> old. <laughs> well, guys, last week we had an awesome opportunity for our seniors to be able to encourage and give advice and maybe throw in some jokes as well to our underclassmen here. So they came down front last week and uh, we filmed them. And so we have an awesome video with our seniors that want to just give you guys some advice and encouragement for you as you go from middle school to high school or through your high school years. So check out this video. I'm about to graduate high school. Here's what you need to know. You can pick your friends. Heck, you can pick your nose, but you really shouldn't pick your friend's nose. That's it. Don't attempt to be your own doctor. So the biggest thing I've learned over these past few years since moving to Lynchburg is just trusting God through the trials and learning to, to never give up on his plan for you. The encouragement I could give you is just trusting him no matter what. Do not give up. No matter how hard life gets, don't give up. It's not good enough to know about Jesus. You have to know him and you have to have a growing relationship with him where you, where you talk to him. 
Hey guys, so my bit of advice for you is to just take advantage of the opportunities that you have right now. As you get older in high school, it gets really hard to tackle everything while maintaining working on college. So just make sure to take advantage of the opportunities and learn from your experience so you, experiences so you can share it with others. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before the fall. God hates a prideful spirit. Life is not about you. Stay humble because that is what God loves and that is what God wants from you. Hi everyone, I just want to encourage you to not waste your time and not waste the opportunities that God gives you. In Ephesians 5, 16 through 17 it says, Make the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. And I, I felt very guilty of wasting my time and like the things that God's taught me because I've always been focused on, well, I want this next and I want that next. But God really provides certain opportunities for you to just learn from Him in that certain time. So I just pray that you will just seek Him in the moment that you're in and not waste your time. Luke 9, 23 through 24 says that we are to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow God. I just want to encourage you guys that um, when God gives you opportunities to stand up and be bold for your faith, to take them, because at the end of everything, um, anything that you do that's for your own glory, not for God's, is really not worth anything. Hey guys, can you stand up? We're gonna go back and do a time of worship.
sing this truth about our God. He would come through always. tonight. You can have a seat and turn your attention to the screens.
What up, TR students? How y'all doing tonight? Yes. I am pumped as well. I'm pumped to be with you guys. Now, I got a question for you. Have you ever been in a situation where you were just a little bit over your head? Anybody ever been in a situation like that? Or you just been, like, I've been in a many of those type of situations, but I was, uh, I came to Liberty as a freshman, which I feel really old because they were showing things from 2003 when some of you were born in the room. I graduated college in 2003. Yes, I'm old. And, uh, and so, uh, so, so when I came to college in 1999, right after I graduated high school, I was, uh, I was in my, my first couple classes and I was you know, in my dorm hall and I met a couple dudes that I became bros with and they asked me one day, they said, hey man, would you like to go climbing with us? Now I like to like hike and you know, be outdoors. And I like to hunt and fish and like, that's like my favorite stuff to do. And, and, and you know, I, I, I say, yeah, man, I'm, I'm all in. Like, like I'm all about it. They're like, awesome. They're like, meet us at this place. Uh, it's about an hour and a half away. Uh, then uh, we'll take, we'll, you know, we'll kind of join up there and then we'll drive and we'll take you to where we're going. Well, when I show up there, I realize that these bros were talking about something a little bit different than what I was talking about. Like I thought, we're gonna go to this mountain that's gonna be awesome and we're gonna hike up to the top of the mountain and be like, oh yeah, like this is cool. I get out of the car and these bros get out of the car and they all have the same type of shoes on. And they all have like harnesses and I see all these ropes in the back of the car and they get out and we start getting situated and they're like, bro, are you wearing that? And I'm like, uh, I had planned on it. And they're like, okay, I got an extra harness and they give me this harness to put on. And, and, and like these bros were serious climbers. I was not a serious climber at this time in my life. And so, and so we start hiking up this mountain and then we start getting to some, some kind of sheer face stuff on the mountain and they're, they're hooking in with all of these ropes and, and, and you know, tools and apparatuses that I was not very familiar with. And, and I'm hiking and these guys were used to it. Like they had done this before so their bodies were acclimated to this type of activity, right? And we're hiking and we're moving and we're working forward. And I'm telling you, we're like halfway up the mountain and I am smoked. Like I can't feel my legs. Like I'm bleeding. I'm like crawling, you know, Lord Jesus, please help me, you know. And they're, and they're just like, yeah, come on, man, let's go, let's go. And, and they're like, like hoisting me up. And I'm like, hey guys, just leave me. Just leave me, I'm good. Just, just pick me up on the way down. And they're like, there's no way we'll be able to fi find the same path on the way down. Like, like you're gonna have to come. And, and, and I mean, they, they were patient with me and they helped me like kind of get up the mountain and they drug me up the mountain. <clears throat> and finally, I made it up to the top of the mountain. Now, when I get up to the top of this mountain, I kid you not, I look out, the skies were clear and you could see for miles and miles and miles, it was unbelievably gorgeous. I mean, rivers and streams and mountains and trees and lakes and I mean, you could see it all from as far <coughs> as you could see all the way to the horizon. You could see everything. I mean, it was stunning. And I'm on the top of this mountain and I'm just chilling and and for me, it wasn't long enough. I've been chilling, you know, I don't know, we were up there for like a half an hour or so, just taking it all in. They're like, all right, it's time to go down. And I'm like, do we have to, you know? And, uh, but I'm up on top of this mountain and I'm just taking it all in. And I'm like, man, this is, like, this is amazing. Like, this is spectacular. And I was thinking, man, this would be awesome if we just take like a helicopter, drop you off and just kind of skip the climb. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't, I don't want to mess with the climb because the climb isn't all that fun. Now, what I think when I think about that is, I think a lot of that 
type of situation goes on in our life. And let me tell you what I think when I, and what I mean by that. What I find is, is that the life that we live right now, the one that you're in right now, the journey that you're on in life, it has a lot of climb in it. And sometimes the terrain of life is pretty rough. Sometimes it's pretty difficult. In fact, sometimes we wanna quit. Sometimes we wanna bow out. Sometimes we wanna stop doing whatever we're doing because it's too hard. And, 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 and this is life, man. Life is a climb. Life is a grind. Life has this, this climb and this grind to it. But what I find is that's difficult for us. This is difficult for you and your generation. It's difficult for my, me and my generation, as old as I am, for us to embrace the fact that the climb and the grind is important in our life. And the reason is, is because we, everywhere around us, get to see the highlight reel all the time. In fact, it's my, one of my favorite things to do is to watch uh, Sports Center. And I like the top 10. Anybody watch the top 10 plays on Sports Center and stuff like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or my favorite, the not top 10. You know, something about watching other people fail makes me feel good about myself. Anybody else? Like, I like watching the highlight reel of things, right? Or, or my, a couple weeks ago, my four year old is like freaking out. Like, he's so mad and he's like, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And I'm like, What's happening right now? You know, like somebody lose an arm. I run into the living room and he's freaking out because there's a commercial on TV. I'm like, bro, what's going on? He's like, I want my show. I want my show. Because he's used to being able to just say into the remote whatever he wants to watch and watch it without commercials or, or have someone fast forward through the commercials or Netflix or whatever. And, and he just has this insight. Like when I was growing up, we had to watch every single commercial on every single show. It was crazy. There was no DVR, fast forwarding, you know, uh, there was none of this stuff, right? But he doesn't know that life. He, can, he wants it now and he most of the time gets it now. The highlight reel. But you realize that, that in Sports Center and in ESPN, in order for them just to get the handful of highlight reel plays, they have to watch literally hundreds of games throughout the week across many different sports with, with thousands, even tens of thousands of plays just to find 10 plays that will fit in that highlight reel. See, 90% of what they report, they don't report on the 90%, they only report on like the 10%, the small percentage of the things that actually happen that are in the highlight reel. And this is difficult for us because we live in a highlight reel world. And social media compounds this for us because we get to see real live in action every friend of ours, their highlight reel all the time. Because we don't post things that are bad and negative, we post the highlight reel. And we can begin to think, well, I mean, like, my life just doesn't measure up. My life isn't as good as their life. My life isn't as as perfect as their life. They, I don't get to go on the vacations that they get to go on and we begin to compare our life to them and, and we start to realize, wait a minute, like, like is, is this what life is all about? Like, 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 I mean, really, like, why is everyone else's life so great and mine so just blah? Here's the truth, students. 90% of your life will be lived in obscurity, you will be unnoticed, you will be unapplauded, you will be in the background, but this 90% of your life is so, so important for you to recognize and win in because this is what's gonna set you up for the 10% when the lights are on. And, and this, is, this is truth. And, and this is what the scripture would even teach us as well. See, what happens is, is that we, you and me, and all of us included, we all want to be significant. We all want to matter. We want our life to matter for something. In fact, for you seniors, you have all of these dreams about what you wanna do in your future. You're graduating high school, and this is like a highlight moment for you, and you're about to step into the next season of your life, whether that's college or military or the workforce or whatever, and when you think about stepping into that next stage, you're not thinking about like negative things. You're thinking about 
positive things. You're thinking about things that you want to accomplish. You're thinking about things that you want to see happen in your future. Maybe you even have goals of what you would like to be making financially by the time you're 30, 40, 50 years old. Or maybe you have some idea in mind of like when you would like to retire, right? And what happens is, is that we start thinking about this type of stuff and we have to start asking ourselves the question, well, how does the world define success based on how the Lord defines success, how God defines success? Because in the world that we live in, it defines success as if you're known, if you're successful, wealthy, famous, if you're at the center of it all, and this is what we pursue. This is what we pursue. But this is not how God defines success. See, a relationship with the Lord is about being faithful to him, and it's about being faithful to him, not just when the lights are on in the 10%, but being faithful to him in the 90%. In fact, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. We live in a world, we live in a world that would rather have, uh, we live in a world that would rather have 30 minutes of fame than 30 years of faithfulness. We live in a world that would rather have 30 minutes of fame than 30 years of faithfulness. And listen, listen, and if we don't think that living for the Lord and being faithful for 30 years is going to get us something at the end of it, they were like, I'm out. I'm out. It's why some of you ask this question sometimes. Man, my life is terrible and I'm depressed and I'm overwhelmed and I'm, where's God in all this? Where's God? I mean, if there's this God that loves me, why is he letting me go through this right now? If he loved me, man, I would have much more of a highlight reel in my life. I see everybody else's life. No way my life is this bad. God, where are you at? But what if God is saying, hey, man, be faithful. The time is coming. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful to me, even when it's hard even when it's not fun. But what happens is, is that we get into these seasons of our life and we're unnoticed and these seasons of our life are unapplauded and these seasons of our life are in the background, which we don't like and they're not a part of this highlight reel. We start going to the season for a long period of time and we feel like we're stuck. And the Proverbs, which we've been studying and in over this series, has something to say about it. In fact, in Proverbs 13, 12, it says this, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. In other words, when we're hoping for something, when we are desirous towards something, but that gets deferred, that gets delayed, that gets pushed off past some timeline that we have in our mind on when we think something should be there, something should happen, it makes our heart grow sick. We get disappointed. So our studies show that we are the wealthiest nation in the world, yet we are the most depressed and medicated nation in the world. How can that be? It's because our highlight reel isn't frequent enough. I want you to consider this thought. What if God has you exactly where he wants you? Even in the grind, even in the, the obscurity, even in the unapplauded season, what if he has you exactly where he wants you? What if he has you where he wants you? Listen, you can do everything right and you're still gonna have seasons of your life where you're just in the climb, where it's not fun, where it's hard, where maybe you wanna quit. Like you can do everything right. Seniors who are graduating, I'm telling you, as you leave from here, and I'm thinking like, man, what is the last thing I wanna leave you with if I was to leave you with a senior message? Listen, you're gonna live, hopefully for most of you, another 60 plus years of your life if you live the life expectancy. My hope for you would be that you recognize that much of the rest of your life is going to be a climb, just like the past part of your life was a climb. And this is significant. In fact, we see this pattern played out in scripture, and I'm about to show it to you. In fact, to put this in your mind, if you wanna write this down, before God uses someone publicly, he forms them privately. Before God uses someone publicly, he forms them privately. Listen, let's, let's look at the scripture. I'm gonna show you a couple of people from the Bible. Noah, Noah. 
We get to Noah, uh, the story of Noah around Genesis chapter six. And, 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 and real quick, for those of you that don't know who Noah is, Noah was a man who the Bible says was righteous and blameless in the sight of God. There was nobody like Noah. And God calls Noah out and he tells Noah, listen, I'm about to make it rain. You need to build an ark. And here's what you're gonna build and here's the dimensions of it and here's what you're gonna do and I'm gonna guide you and lead you in the process. And Noah's like, what? I don't know how to build an ark. I don't know how to build a boat. It hasn't rained. There's no water. I'm in dry land. Like, what are you talking about? God says, build an ark. And Noah starts building the ark. Now, what we see from scripture is, is why he's building the ark. He gets ridiculed. People are coming by going, dude, what are you doing? They're making fun of him. They're laughing at him. Now, check this out. Do you know how long it took Noah to build the ark? It took Noah 120 years to build the ark. 120 years. Like, do you think that maybe 80 years in, Noah had a log over his shoulder and was carrying it over to the boat going, God, are you sure? Are you sure, Lord? Like, are you sure this is what you want me to do? 120 years, are you serious? Man, we can't, I don't, I don't wanna wait like 10 minutes in the Chick-fil-A line. 120 years of grind. What about Moses? Moses was this guy that God had called out because the people of God were in Egypt, the Israelites, and they were in slavery in Egypt. And the Egyptians were very harsh on the Israelites because they were in slavery. And God calls out Moses to go and deliver the people of Israel, the man that God would use to, to, to cause Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the most powerful man in the world, to release the Israelites and to save God's people from enslavement in Egypt. Now, now, this is what I want you to see. The story of when this of takes place in Moses' life starts in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter one, we see the story of the birth of Moses. Then it says this in Exodus 2, 11, and after Moses had grown up, one day after Moses had grown up, we see Moses' birth, and then the story picks up, check it, check it. The story picks up when Moses is 40 years old, 40. Then we see this little scene take place where Moses actually kills a man who is beating the enslaved Israelites and to defend the Israelites, he, he kills this guy and then he tries to cover it up and then he realizes it isn't covered up so he runs for his life and listen, then he's in exile, check it, check it, for 40 more years. Years. In fact, the scripture says, and after a long period of time. And then Moses is out one day with his sheep as a shepherd. And he sees this bush burning and it's on fire, but it's not being consumed. And God showed up and had a conversation with Moses. He told Moses, I want you to go deliver my people. Listen, when Moses was 80 years old, Think about this life of faithfulness that Moses had had to the Lord. And God comes to him and calls him out when he's 80. Sometimes when we think about people from the Bible and we hear these stories, for those of you who think they're, we think about young people. You know when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den? He was in his 80s when he was thrown into the lion's den. Not some young pup who was standing up for the Lord and, and as a result got thrown into the lion's den. This was a man who was advanced in age, but he had remained faithful to God for his entire life. What about David? King David, the greatest king in Israel's history. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. He wrote most of the Psalms. We, we know so much about David and his, his kingdom. If you wanna learn a lot about David, go read the book of 2 Samuel, which tells us like the life and the story of David's life. And what we know about David is that David in his younger years, he was pretty obscure. In fact, 
The current king, this guy by the name of Saul, did something that disobeyed God, and as a result, God's favor came off of Saul, and then God sent the prophet Samuel to go to this guy's house, this guy by the name of Jesse, and he says, I want you to go to this man's house because one of his sons is gonna be the next king of Israel. He goes to this guy's house, the guy brings all of his sons out, Samuel goes down the line of all of his sons who are big and older and muscular and, and good looking and all this stuff, and he gets to the end of them and he's like, yeah, these aren't the guys. You got any more sons? And Jesse, David's dad says, well, I mean, yeah, like the youngest, but you know, he's, he's tending the sheep and I mean, he's like, not him. Not him. Yeah, bring him, bring him. And they bring David before Samuel, and Samuel, the prophet, anoints David as king of Israel. Now listen, listen. David was anointed king of Israel somewhere between the ages of 10 and 13 years old. That's the age of you middle school students in the room. Now listen, he's anointed king at 13. Then at age 17, he kills a guy by the name of Goliath. If you know the story, David and Goliath, he's 17, senior in high school. Then, then he becomes king of part of Israel when he's 30. David's anointed at 13, 10 to 13, and he does not become king, at least even a part of the kingdom, until he's 30 years old. Much of those seasons of his life, in fact, if you go read and you understand the life of David, he was on the run, he was running for his life. King Saul was after him, trying to kill him. Many, many times over, Saul tried to kill him. And David's on the run, he's living in caves, he's, he's constantly moving, constantly traveling, just to, to keep his life and to save his life. Complete obscurity. History doesn't record that. All of the things that David was doing, it just records the highlight reel. But he remained faithful. What about Jesus? Did God love Jesus, his son? Sure he did. Jesus did nothing wrong. The Bible tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Now check this out. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your Bible, those four books, known as the Gospels, are the, are the tell us about the life of Jesus as he lived here on this earth, those four. There are 99 chapters in the Gospels, 99. Only four chapters of the 99, or 10%, speak to the first 33 years, or first three, 30 years of Jesus' life, the 10%. 30 years. Jesus was crucified when he was 33 years old. 95 chapters speak. 95 speak to the last three years of Jesus' life. 95 of the 99 chapters of the Gospels speak to three years of Jesus' life. And only four chapters to the first 30 years of Jesus' life. In fact, Mark and John don't even mention the first 30 years of Jesus' life. Now here's the question. Were they important? You better believe it. Just because something is unapplauded doesn't mean that it's unimportant. Just because something's unapplauded doesn't mean that it's unimportant. In fact, there were things being formed during this time. In fact, we see in Luke chapter two, and then from that time on, he grew in stature and wisdom in favor with God and man. Now, what does it mean to be a Christian? To be a Christian means to be Christ-like or to be like Jesus. We're growing and we're becoming more like Jesus. Now, here's my question for you. When we say that, what are we typically talking about? We are typically talking about the highlight reel. We're typically talking about his ministry. 
and what we see. But what if we should also be talking about how he didn't compromise in obscurity? What if be like Jesus isn't just serve like he did in his ministry, but what if it's also be faithful to the Lord like he did when the lights are not on? What if it's that too? I think it is. You wanna be like Jesus? Don't compromise in obscurity. Before God uses someone publicly, he forms them privately. Almost every person that God uses in the Bible and now and throughout all of history were people, men and women, where you don't see the 90% of their life, but they were faithful in that time so that when the lights were on in the 10%, amazing things happen. God builds something in these years of your life that don't seem that important, and they're very important. In fact, I was listening to this radio uh, podcast a couple years ago, and as I was listening to the podcast, there was this scout, and he was one of the top scouts for, um, for the NBA, and, uh, and he was sharing a little bit about just some of the high school um, uh, you know, uh, top prospects and some of their, um, their showcase uh, tournaments and things that they would do, their camps that they would do. And he was telling this story about this one particular camp. He says, yeah, we're at this camp and you know, all of these high school players, the top 100 players in the country are invited to this camp and, you know, and it's the best of the best and all the, 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 the professional scouts and college scouts and coaches are there and they're watching these high school kids play uh, in this arena and, um, and oftentimes there are a few players that get invited that are not like in the top tier group but they get invited because uh, uh, someone couldn't come in the top tier group and they ended up coming in their place. He said, these things are pretty typical, you know. He said, I usually get there about a half an hour early. He said, I show up an half an hour early. I start setting my stuff up, getting ready. This is a leading scout for the NBA. He said, I'm setting all my stuff up. And he said, about half of the players were already there. They were sitting in the bleachers. They had their earbuds in. You know, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're just, uh, you know, uh, listening to music, got their hoodies on. They're just kind of chilling in the stands, feel them talking to each other. He said, but there was this one guy. And he was out on the court. And he was shooting shot after shot after shot. Getting his own rebound. Shot after shot after shot. He said he thought it was interesting. The rest of the players get there, the practice, the, 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 the show, you know, they're playing games, they're doing all this stuff. He said everybody leaves the gym, all the players rush out, everybody's hungry, they're trying to get out of there. He says, I'm packing up my stuff, the scouts are packing up their stuff. And he said that same guy was standing over there at the free throw line. And every day at the end, he would stand on the free throw line and he would shoot until he swished nothing but net, not touching the rim, 10 free throws in a row. And he said, man, you don't know how difficult that is. He said, and the next day, the same thing. The next day, the same thing. The next day, the same thing. And he's talking on this radio, and he says to the radio host, and he says, he says, that's when us as the scouts, that's when we knew that Steph Curry was gonna be a special player in the NBA. And this is what he said. Listen, before Steph Curry... Before Steph Curry was the only unanimous MVP of the NBA, before he was the first back-to-back -back MVP uh, 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 candidate and winner of the NBA, and he's the leading MVP candidate right now in the NBA, he was in the grind. He was obscure. He wasn't even considered a top player. But he understood that the grind precedes the glory. The grind always precedes the glory, students. The grind always precedes the glory, seniors. It always precedes the glory. And let me tell you, everything in your life that matters has a grind to it. Everything that matters has a grind. Your academics, it has a grind. You have to study, you have to work at it. Some of you, you don't, right? And you're not gonna get the glory. Career has a grind to it. You have to work hard. Marriage has a grind to it. Marriages break down because both people in the marriage don't commit 
that we're gonna fight for this marriage and we're gonna work on this marriage and I'm gonna keep learning about you and you're gonna keep learning about me and you grind in the marriage to love one another and learn from one another so that you can support one another. Children are a grind. They are a grind, man. I have two of them. It's hard work. Everything that matters in life has a grind to it, everything. And you are preparing in the grind right now for how you're going to handle the grind in your future. Proverbs 14, 23 says this, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Let me say it again. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Some of you know how to talk. You can talk a game. The grind precedes the glory. The work. So why do I tell this to you, and why is this an important message for you as students? I'm gonna tell you why. Hey, bros, chill out right there in the middle. Hey, guys that are, hey, yeah, orange shirt. Yeah, right there, stop. It's a grind. Why I tell this to you? Because listen, this is the message that I hear from people in your generation. Now's my time to live it up. Now's my time to be me. Now's my time to do what I wanna do. Now's my time to do what I wanna do. Now's my time to live my life. Listen, I'll have responsibility when I get older. I'll get this God thing situated when I get older. I'll get this responsibility thing situated when I get older. Now's my time to live it up. Now's my time to play. Now's play time. And what you fail to understand is that you are burning the building years of your life. Now is not a time to burn. Now is a time to build. These are seasons that are preparing you for what God is gonna do in your life in the future. In fact, I'll tell you this, I believe that you are living in the most important years of your life. And I'm not just saying that to be fickle, I got data to back it up. I believe that the eight most important years of anybody's life are from, eight, are from 14 to 22 years old. There's an eight year period. In fact, I'll put it up here on the board and hopefully um, you guys can see it with the camera on it. I'll put it up here on the board so you can kind of see it and help explain this to you. Zero, that's your birth date. The life expectancy in the United States is 78 years old. We're gonna pretend that you eat a couple extra healthy meals and you live until you are 80 years old. All right, that's your life. Now, I want to show you something here. Most people don't really remember much about the first five years of their life. They remember a few details, maybe a few highlights from the highlight reel, a birthday party, a trip to Disney World, stuff like that, but they don't remember significant things from the first five years of their life. But you know what they do? So that means that if you're in this room right now and you're 15 years old, you've lived like, like 10 years. This is you right here. Which by the way, here's high school right here. That's high school. And, and, and this is how much you got left. It's a blip. It's a drop in the bucket. It's nothing. It's nothing. I believe the day most important years of anybody's life are 14 to 22 years old. This little section right here. 14 to 22 years old. Raise your hand if you're between the ages of 14 and 22 years old right now. Raise your hand. Look around. Put your hands down. These are the eight most important years of life. Let me tell you what happens. Let me tell you what happens in this time. Your brain actually is being developed until you're 25 years old. But beyond that, from 14 to 22 years old, your morals, your values, the career path you're gonna take, the type of person you're gonna marry, all of the major decisions for your future, almost all of those things are solidified worldview, from 14 to 22 years old. Now let me tell you, I believe the two most important years of anybody's life 
our senior year of high school and freshman year of college, two most important years. Now let me tell you why I believe that. Studies show that people make it to their senior year, sexually pure as virgins, at a rate of 84%. Starting their senior year of high school, 84% of high school students are virgins. After freshman year of college, the statistic drops to 16%. Let me tell you what happens. Senior year of high school, everybody celebrates you. They talk about how amazing you are. It's all about hanging out with your friends. You start slowly disconnecting from church because it's about your life and what you wanna do when you're hanging out with everybody and you wanna spend this last precious time with people. Then you get to the summertime and it's all about doing what you wanna do and you disconnect even more from church. Then you go to college and you start hanging out with your friends and they're gonna stay out till super late at night on a Saturday night. The last thing I wanna do is go to church on a Sunday morning, but eventually you get yourself to wanting to go to church and so you show up maybe three or four weeks into college and the church you go to just ain't like your previous church and you don't really like it. And then the next week you don't go, the next week you don't wanna go and the next thing you know, you're three years into college and you ain't been to church one time. what happens. These are significant years. In fact, I'll tell you this, being a pastor now for almost 20 years, people that don't win these eight years of their life, they never recover. They never recover. I'm not saying that the Lord can't change them and save them here and, and, and things change in their life. I'm saying that the damage is already done. They, can't, they won't recover fully. I'm, I turned 40 in a couple weeks. Crazy. Thank you. I turned 40 in a couple weeks. <clears throat> I go home now. I go home now. And the guys that I partied with in high school, they're, most of them have burned through at least their first marriage. Some of them two marriages already. They have no relationship with their kids. They're 40 years old. They're still sitting at the bar at the same restaurants that we went to when we were younger in our life. And they're 40. You can't burn the building years of your life and think that that will carry you. You can't do it. You can't do it. I'm gonna close with a couple thoughts here, a couple of biblical truths. The first thing is that God is in control. God's in control. God knows exactly where you are right now in your life. He knows exactly where he's taking you, and he knows what the destination is gonna look like for you. You might feel unnoticed, you might feel unimportant to others, but you are not to God. Don't be discouraged, keep climbing. The second thing that I wanna to say to you is this, obscure seasons, are sacred places. Obscure seasons are sacred places. Before God uses someone publicly, he forms them in, in obscurity, as I mentioned to you guys, and this is important for you to know for your own personal life, that there are trials in the obscure seasons of the life that you're in that are building character and strength for you for when the lights are gonna be on in the future. And the last one is this. Faithfulness in the 90% will lead to fruitfulness in the 10%. Faithfulness in the 90% will produce fruitfulness in the 10%. Are you building a life towards fruitfulness or a life, uh, or a life towards fruitlessness? Listen, these are, these are significant years of your life, and for you college, or about to be college age students that are in the room, those of you that are graduating, know that you're in the important years of your life. Take it seriously when you step out of here to make sure that you stay connected to the church. You make sure that you stay connected in your relationship with God, that you keep accountability in your life for, for whatever, that you're spending time in God's word, that you're chasing after him with everything that you have. And for the rest of you in here, be faithful to God no matter what. And I know some of you are stuck right now. And I know some of you are in an obscure season. And I know some of you feel unnoticed and I know some of you feel unapplauded. And I know that's tough for you, but know that God is in control and he has a plan for your life. And if you will be faithful, there will come a time where he will call you out like he did with Noah and Moses 
and David and others to make a significant difference in this world. The band's gonna come out and, uh, and I'm gonna pray for us and, uh, um, and then we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do next. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you, God, that we thank you, God, that you give us examples in your word, men and women who become mentors to us on how to live our life now, that we can be inspired by their faithfulness to you. God, I know that there's students in this room right now. They're treating these years of their life right now too casually. They're burning the building years of their life. Maybe they've said themselves, now's my time to play around. Now's my time to live it up. Now's my time to do what I wanna do. Now's my time to be me. God, I pray right now, Lord, that you will arrest that thinking from them. And God, that your Holy Spirit would guide them and direct them. And that they would change that thinking. And that they would begin building a life of faithfulness right now in this room and in this place. That they would commit to that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the, the band's gonna come up and they're gonna lead us. And before they do, what I would like to do is I would like to invite real quick all of the seniors up here to the front. So if you're a senior, come on up here to the front. Just stand on the front. Give it up for them. Give it up for the seniors. One day you're gonna be a senior and everybody's gonna be giving it up for you. Come on up here, seniors. Gather around down here in front. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. Bring it on in. Bring it on in. All right. Um, man, thank you guys for being a part of this ministry. I know some of you have been a part of this ministry for a long time, and, uh, and you have influenced a lot of this ministry and what this ministry is gonna look like going forward, and we're proud of you. And we want you to know that we're gonna be praying for you, and we got your back. And we want you to know that we wanna be a resource to you. We don't want you to be a statistic. We wanna help you. And so if that's helping you find a church where you go, if you're going somewhere out of state, out of place, out of whatever, if that's helping you find some accountability, if that's helping you walk through some difficult seasons of your life, if that's just praying for you, we want you to know that we're here for you. And when I say that, I don't mean that just generically. I'm saying I'm here for you. Like, I'll give you my cell number. You can text me, like, you know, whatever. Or, you know, we can, you know, uh, email us, whatever. We'll set it up. But we want to be here for you. And I mean that, like, from the bottom of my heart. That's real. You know what I mean? Now, we want to close out our service tonight. Uh, and we want to, before we go into this last uh, song of worship, is we want to pray over you. But this is what I thought would be cool. I realized that there's some of you out there who have friends up here or you have people that you love and you care about, maybe they're a sibling or whatever. Um, what I wanna ask you to do is, if that's you and you got someone up here like that or you're one of our volunteer leaders or a small group leader of one of these, or these, some of these students up here, I wanna invite you guys to come on up here uh, around them, try to stay as socially distanced the best you can. Come on up here and kind of gather around them. We're gonna pray over them and I want you to hold your hands out and pray towards them. And uh, if you don't know them, that's fine. You stay in your seat. <laughs> and I'll give you a second. Let's try to keep it chill. Try to keep it chill. <laughs> now, As they're coming forward, I'm gonna give instructions to everybody else. Everybody else, I'm gonna start praying here in a minute, but I'm gonna teach you something. I'm gonna teach you something, so listen. We're gonna start praying here in a minute, but this is what I want you to do. If you feel comfortable, I want you to hold your hands out towards them as I pray here in a minute. And listen, listen. I believe that prayer is a participation thing. Let me tell you what I mean by that. When the pastor gets on stage on Sunday morning and he's praying, I'm not in my seat listening to the pastor pray. I start praying with the pastor. I'm participating in the prayer. I'm praying with the pastor. Then when the pastor prays, it's a cue for me to also pray. Does that make sense? So I want you to hold your hands out towards them and quietly to yourself or out loud or however you wanna do it. I don't care, whatever you feel comfortable with. 
as I pray, I want you to pray for them and pray for the seniors. And you may not know them by name. You can just pray. Just God, be with these seniors. Pray whatever, you know, help them to remain faithful. Uh, God, protect them. What, whatever you want to pray for them, just pray for them. I'm going to pray for them now. But as I pray, I want you to participate in this prayer time and pray with me. So hold your hands out and let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your kindness that we could be here tonight in this place to pray over these students. God, we know that you can do incredible, unbelievable things with young people. As your scripture teaches us over and over and over again, David being an example of someone we mentioned earlier, God, I pray that you would use these seniors in unbelievable ways, in ways that they could never take credit for because there's no possible way that they would be as good enough to accomplish what you're gonna do in their life. And God, I pray that you would guard them and you would protect them, protect their mind, protect their eyes. I pray that you would put people in their path, Lord, and churches and ministry leaders and friends that love you, that will keep them accountable and, and will, will help encourage them in their faith. And I pray that they would remain faithful you got to pray that as they get to the end of their life, whether that's 80 years or 100 years or whatever that time is, Lord, I pray, I pray that they would be able to say like Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. I pray that over these students. God, would you be, them, be with them? Would they feel and experience your love in every place that they go? And would they know that they're not alone because you're with them? And when they get discouraged in the obscure seasons, when they feel like no one cares and no one's around and they're stuck, God, would you just give little prompts to them reminding them that you're watching and that you know and that you care? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let's worship together. Students, we don't want this to be the end of our prayer over these seniors and over each other. So would you stand with me? If you're inclined to stay down here even with us and worship here at the front, you're invited to do that. But if you would keep your hands out and sing this with me. You're the God who makes the giants fall. You bring down the walls of Jericho. You're the God who brings the this for your life today. You're the God who parts the ocean wide just to bring us closer to your side. You're the God who brings the dead to life. We believe. We believe.
time tonight, students. To God, how great you are, great things you have done for everything we've seen. There is more to come, every victory, every battle won, for everything we've seen, we know. Sing that again. Sing it with me. God, how great. Sing to him. Everything we've seen. praise students it's worthy of clapping about it's worthy of cheering about would you pray with me now father for these seniors who are here in this place personally father i want to just uplift them and pray over them for the future that you have set out before them even now i pray jesus that they draw near to you now in the coming days and that if they have been, Father, you would continue to honor their pursuit of you. But if they haven't, Father, that even in this moment, they would begin to seek your face for direction, for peace, for comfort. This life is not promised to be easy for any of us. But it is promised that in you, we find rest, we find peace, we find hope. So let us rest in you, Jesus whether we're going out, graduating, or we're, we're still in this season of growing and building, Father, let us not miss these so important years in our lives for what you want to, to do and have for us, for our future. Because we believe, as your church, that there is more to come. The church is not declining. Your church is not withering away. No, Jesus, the church, your church, is stronger than ever and through this next generation I believe in revival I believe in change I believe that this world will look different because they've determined to set their eyes on you and believe that in you there is so much more the best is yet to come in you Jesus and because of that we worship you and we pray this in your holy name Jesus and all God's children say Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. We have a few announcements for you. Amen. Amen. Is this thing on? What is going hey. on to our students? What an awesome set of worship we had. Nope. Hey, before we, uh, before we dismiss right now, um, me and Christian, we just have a couple of announcements. So tonight has been our senior night. All you seniors, raise your hands. Make some noise. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. So we gave you guys La Coretta for dinner. And we just want to give you some dessert as well. So for all you seniors, we got the best ice cream in Lynchburg. This isn't Monkey Joe's. This isn't um, Mr. Goody's. We have outside the cone for you seniors after we dismiss in Pate Chapel. So go ahead and make sure you show your green wristband. You spoil them, huh? I guess so. <laughs> we got some ice cream for you. We just want to congratulate you and thank you for being a part of our ministry and for our next announcement, here in two weeks on June 2nd, we have another one of our amazing baptism nights. So if you want to take your next step of faith in your walk with Christ, you can email us at studentministry at trbc.org. We would love to celebrate this event with you. Christian? That's right. After that, on June 2nd, we have what we call water wars going on. And so after Jeez. that, after the baptism service, after our service in here, we're going to go down, down the parking lot, down to the, like, what they call the band field and the practice field of LCA. And what we're going to do there is we're just going to, we're going to see that little inflatable on the bottom left of the screen, that inflatable, we're renting that. It's like an 18 feet, 20 foot uh, slide that has a Jeez. double drop on it, water slide. <laughs> We're gonna have water balloons. We're gonna have yeah. buckets of water. We're just gonna throw on each other. 
It's gonna be so much fun. We're gonna have Kona Ice out there as well. It's gonna be amazing. So make sure you're here for that dress to get a little wet, just a little bit, because you're gonna get a little wet going down that water slide. And real quick, real quick, last for our very, very last, last, last announcement. So many of you know Dave here. He's an awesome guy. He's really cool. He's been kind of doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff with us and doing kind of like internship type work with us this whole year, actually. And he's been, he works uh, part-time at Chick-fil-A. He's been going to school full, full time and he's been helping out with us, putting in a lot of hours. Well, this Wednesday, today actually is his last Wednesday here with us. And then he's, he's going down to Augusta, Georgia for- I'll be back. For the summer. He's gonna be interning in Augusta, Georgia. So Dave, we wanted to say thank you so we got you, we got you a $50 Amazon gift card, $50 in Chick-fil-A gift cards, and a personalized note in there from wow. Jeremy as well. As a thank, thank you. you. Say th can we say thank, thank you to you. Dave? I couldn't do it without all y'all. Thank you. All right. You guys are dismissed seniors. Go to Pate Chapel for Have ice cream. Have a great summer.